Hey everyone, and thank you so much to everyone who joined us online and in person for the National Child Care Innovation Summit, co-hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and the Department of Commerce. We're very excited here to have two of our panelists join us again uh, for a deeper dive, continuing those conversations. Uh, I'm joined today by Adam and Hayden. I'll let them introduce themselves, but thrilled to be talking more with uh, the folks behind Red Rooster Coffee and Appleseed Childhood Education. Adam and Hayden, great to see you guys again. Great to Good see you, Aaron. Excellent. Um, so for the folks who maybe this is their, their first time um, hearing from you both, uh, let's just go ahead and do a quick round of introductions. Adam, we'll start with you. Uh, so I am Adam Alson. I am owner of Alson Farms in Rensselaer, Indiana, and also president and co-founder of Appleseed Childhood Education. Hey. Yeah, I'm Hayden Paulsino Hensley, and I am the co-owner and co-founder of Red Rooster Coffee in Floyd, Virginia. So we've got Indiana, we've got Floyd, Virginia, you know, small towns, kind of rural areas, uh, dare I say. Um, and Adam and Hayden, I, I noticed that you both have sort of your, your maybe primary jobs or, or day jobs, if you will. You also have a huge footprint in your communities around child care. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm assuming that when you went into, you know, the, the Alston Farms, Red Rooster Coffee, uh, on day one, when you were planning your business strategy, uh, I'm assuming that you weren't like, and also child care. Uh, and so I think the where we should probably start is kind of, um, and, and Adam, will start with you again, but paint us a picture a little bit of, uh, of your community in Indiana, you know, sort of when you decided that that was going to be uh, where you're going to put down roots, raise your kids, uh, and then you know, sort of how this idea of, you know, starting pushing for a, a child care center came around. Yes. No, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, you know, so Rensselaer, Indiana is a town of about 6,000 people. It is uh, pretty agriculture, agriculturally and light industry based. Um, it is halfway between Chicago and Indianapolis, about 45 minutes north of Purdue University. Um, it's pretty rural. It's pretty small. Um, I'm here because I grew up here. I uh, grew up on on the farm, um, and when I was 18, I decided to get the heck out of here. And then when I was about uh, 30, I decided it didn't seem so bad. It actually seemed like a pretty good place to live. Um, so I have, uh, I, I'm married with my wife, Carly Tressel Allison, and we have two kids, nine and five. And uh, Rensselaer is a great place to live. Um, it's a great place to raise a family. And, um, you know, like you said, Aaron, child care was not a part of it when I decided to come back and take over the farm. Um, you know, I'm a corn and soybean farmer. Uh, child care for, for most corn and soybean farmers is about as far. <laughs> it's not what you, that's not the first thing or the last thing you think about when you, when you go to bed at night. Um, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, my wife's a writer. Um, I'm in, I'm into child care because of this. My wife's a writer when our son was, was 18 months. My wife was writing a book um, and we needed child care help. Uh, there was at the time one licensed child care center in Rensselaer, and um, we sent our child we sent our child there. And you know, frankly, I had a whole bunch of preconceived notions about um, what that meant, and they were all they were all negative. But we did it anyway. And within about two weeks, they were uh, they they were I was I was proven wrong on all of those. You know, our, I, I saw the benefits of of quality child care and early childhood education. Um, then uh, about six years ago, that that one child care center in Rensselaer closed um, and, and it put us in a, in a lurch as a family. But you know, more importantly, we saw how it affected our community, um, and affected the other families that, that went that attended that center. Um, you know, and then one thing led to another. And um, I know we'll talk about this more, Aaron, but then, you know, started figuring out and seeing like and you know, realizing like this is important for for places. Um, and it's, you know, it's important for farmers, it's important for, for agriculture, it's important for a whole bunch of different groups. I'll, I'll, I'll let, I'll, you know, that's, no, you're that's good, the, you're good, yeah. that's, no, and, yeah, it's just like, you to talk about how, how one thing led to another, for sure. <laughs> there's a lot and, of that. Uh, I think, Aiden, you're yeah. probably going to be the same <laughs> way, right? Like, there's a, there's a lot of that, one thing leads to another. Yeah. Um, and Hayden, uh, you had a little bit of a similar situation where there was sort of, uh, you know, a, a childcare situation in the town and, and then there wasn't, but I don't want to jump ahead too much um, in part because I think it really fills in the story, but also just because I love it. Can you talk a little bit about both how you got into coffee roasting 
and then also, you know, sort of, sort of how you went from being the, the local coffee roaster to also a uh, local child care provider. Yeah, sure. It's funny, uh, Adam, it, it, you're just like a mirror image uh, of my life. It, it, it's, uh, I left the town of Floyd, uh, which, you know, the town itself has 450 people. The county has uh, approaching 16,000. Uh, left when I was 18, went to college, came back when I was around 30. And um, I have a nine and a five-year-old, so so we have so much in common. Um, my wife and I started Red Rooster Coffee in 2010 uh, when she said, hey, I don't really like the coffee that we're serving at, at the coffee shop that she owned um, that was above the uh, bookstore that was run by my mother-in-law, her mother. So coffee and books, obviously a uh, lifelong pairing, but when she suggested the idea of roasting coffee, I was all in. I had I was working construction at the time and, and really looking to get into something that was maybe more, um, I don't know, a little bit more craft-based and, and something creative. So uh, yeah, fast forward um, five years and we have a, a young son. We have a baby on the way. You know, that was fine. That was fine for maybe the first year where we sort of pulled it together with uh, her sisters and, and various other, you know, my parents, her parents, child care, just sort of being passed around to the family as, as so many people do. Right. And then we realized, oh, my gosh, there is there's actually a huge uh, need here because our employees were having babies. Our employees had small kids. We had single parents, single mothers who had children who were looking for a way to continue their careers, continue to work. And um, well, actually we started uh, paying my sister-in-law to watch a bunch of kids, a bunch of employee kids and family kids. And we had her own payroll. And then one day we thought, well, you know, this is not strictly speaking the way that this is supposed to be done and we started really pursuing the idea of well what if we did it the way it's supposed to be done what if we changed direction here and started and, and thought about licensing a child care facility and offer child care to our employees who have this need uh in floyd and so both of you had, I mean, in addition to just the, the parallels um, in your life between, you know, moving back home, wanting to raise your kids, and then seeing a need. And, and Adam, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that community need. You mentioned that, you know, your son started attending a, a child care center. You saw the value. You saw the importance of it. Where did it escalate from, you know, oh, we need to find child care, you know, for, for our kiddo. Yeah. And then what was the, yeah, what, what was kind of the transition point where it went from, oh, I need to do something to make sure that a lot more people's kids also have access to quality care? You know, it's, you know, I, 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 I think the right for, for me and us, you know, the biggest thing was saying like, oh, was the realization, you know, that, that kind of, you know, that Hayden had as well that like, oh, this is like actually a pretty big problem for our place. Um, and, you know, the idea of having affordable and quality childcare in a community ends up being actually one of those things that's really important, I think, for the future, especially for small rural communities. Um, you know, it's where, where like most rural communities have a, have a demographic problem, right? They have a problem where they're getting smaller and they're getting older. And, you know, it, it's, it's like, okay, well, you know, it's in least the, you know, it's labor force issues and, and, and like, how do we attract people here? How do we keep them here? How do we keep families here? Which leads into school courts and school systems, which are really important for, you know, the health of, of places. But like, at the end of the day, all these things come back to is like, I want my place to survive and I'd like it to survive. And I'd like my kids to have the opportunity that I had to come back and to come to a place that is worth living in. Um, and you know, as, as going down, going down this path is realizing that like having, having the availability of childcare in a rural community can be an attractive to people who want to live here, which, you know, to, 
you know, it, it's the, you know, you get these like indirect effects where like, I'd like there to be interesting and young I, I, people that live here. I like to be a part of a community that feels like it's growing and that, and that people want to be a part of, you know, when they're 25, when they're 20, when they're 28, when they're 30, like me, that like, it's an op, it's a chance to come back because like, you know, that's, that's better for my life. That's better for my wife's life. That's better for my kids' lives and their kids, you know, and their friend, my kids' friends' lives and everyone. Um, and I didn't realize it when we started this, but I do now that like, I, I, you know, I think that, you know, child, let me put it this way. I think the communities that invest in childcare would be the ones that be able to attract those and, and, and retain those young families here in the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm glad we're on the front of it. So. Absolutely. And so out of your push for child care, you had to do a lot of barnstorming, sort of go to different community members. Um, yeah. Hayden, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but Hayden, with Red Rooster and it being sort of employer-based child care, your snowball was a little bit more internal. Is that an accurate way to, to kind of phrase that? Like you um, you mentioned that you uh, had your sister-in-law that started, you know, kind of providing care to uh, different kids of employees. And then you realized we may need to make this a little bit more official and we may need to make it a little bit bigger. And so how did it go from your, your sister-in-law providing care, making sure that, you know, kids had a safe spot and employees were able to thrive at Red Rooster to being, you know, to, to going to, we're going to create an actual child care center? Yeah, well, I think this goes to a point that uh, I've heard Adam make too, is that, you know, the, the management of something like this is really critical. Um, you know, we were blindly naive and very lucky and the timing of everything came together in such a way that it worked for us because we had just purchased our the building that we're in right now. And that building is um, fairly big. It's 11,000 square feet. And when we first moved in there, we thought we'll never fill this up. Um, we were very wrong about that. But um, in the time at the beginning, we, we had extra square footage that had bathrooms, had a sink, had a little kitchenette, and had room for children to be in. And so uh, it just felt very natural, organic, that, that that would be where the childcare would go. And so we were, we were just sort of moving the babysitting in there. And then we just started thinking like, this is sort of black market. Like we need to, we really need to um, think more about this. And at that exact time, the local Montessori school at the time closed and this incredible teacher um, was referred to us who is so smart, so organized, had the experience of getting the previous school license. So it already gone through the process. And when we pitched it to her, it, I mean, she really didn't hesitate. She said, yeah, I could do that. Let's do it. And that was six years ago. And she's still the director of the school. So I think some of it just has to do with the fact that we were naive. You know, we, we weren't profitable at the time. We had very little money and it, it felt somehow like less of a risk. It was like nothing out of nothing is nothing. So why don't we just try it and see what happens? Um, and, and, and here we are. I love that. Um, may as well just try it and that's <laughs> and uh hayden I, th I think that you did a great job of encapsulating sort of the the blossoming from uh as you said like babysitting into sort of early childhood education right and so adam uh from your perspective where was that sort of was it organic like hayden mentioned or was there sort of an aha moment or a or even like a moment of desperation um, when you were like, okay, we need to do something about this stat. And uh, what, what yeah. was the first thing no. you took? Well, like we, so in, in, in Rensselaer, there has been a, a history of um, attempts at community-based childcare. And they, they've all failed for various reasons. And like, and frankly, um, you know, and frankly, when, um, oh, it was, it's, it's surprising that any, it, 
I have so much, let me put it this way. I have so much respect for all of the people in our place that has tried to do this in the past because it is really hard. <clears throat> like that you have volunteers trying to, trying to figure out how to operate a licensed child care center and, and, and also like make the PNL break somewhere near zero. And those two things are very hard to do. Um, you know, so like from what Aaron, from what we did is we tried to look at it a little bit differently. Like before we don't, before we, before we went into it, we said, okay, well, what, what do you need to do this in, in a rural place? You know, and like we really quickly, we realized like you're going to have quality childcare. You really, it's very difficult to, it's impossible. Actually it's impossible. It's impossible to pass along the full cost of care to, um, um, uh, Man, you guys with your emails, man, are just crushing me right now. It's, it's coming up in the text. So I'm gonna start this over. So, like, you, you, um, what we did first is that we we said, okay, well, well, what do you need to have, and why why have other iterations of this failed in this area? And you know, we we realized like you need to we need to have a we need to find a, we need to find a childcare operator that's experienced and knows how to run a licensed childcare center. We also need to find a building. And we need to we need to we need to find funding for this because at the end of the day like child care in like you know in floyd or in rensselaer or in any other like rural community and actually in, like most communities in the united states like if it's going to be quality it can't be affordable for families like our, per capita incomes are not high enough in in rensselaer and in our area to to you know pass along eighteen thousand dollars per child per year to parents it, you know you know like the market's pretty efficient, right? And uh, um, childcare doesn't exist where it can't make money. Um, so, so we took it. We kind of took a different tack where this had. We viewed this as like it has to be a community funded thing. Um, you know, then we started. You know, then we we looked. We were like, oh well, maybe there's some like state and federal grants for this, or maybe there's philanthropy, you know, outside of our area that that supports you know capital campaigns and projects like this and we realized very quickly no there isn't um you know so it ended up being for us it was like you know this has to, if we're going to get this off the ground and this is going to exist this has to be this has to be funded and by our place um so we've been very lucky we have a wonderful um experienced child care child care operator called right steps child development centers they're a 50 year old nonprofit uh, based out of lafayette indiana um they operate seven child high quality affordable child care centers in uh, our area. Um, so we partnered up with them first. We've partnered with our uh, regional health care system, uh, Franciscan Health, uh, for a facility on their hospital campus. And then on the funding side of things, you know, it's it's been a wonderful outpouring of support from local employers and local philanthropy and also local government as well. Um, you know, we're a line item in our county's budget um, and our city of you know, our city government has, has uh, you know, invested funds in Apple Seed and our center for the last three years. And, you know, it just, one thing leads to another. And, you know, for us, we got an operator, we found a building, and we're always working on funding. We're still working on funding, you know, because, like, it loses... Our center, Apple Tree Rinsley, loses money every day. It's open. So it's it's open today, and it's losing money today, and and that's never going to change. Um, and and that's okay. Um, but it's also the way that that's kind of the way we went about it. Where it's like you you know, you know, I think Hayden probably say the same thing. It's just you say, oh, this sounds like a good idea, and then it's it's um it's it's actually a pretty complex problem <laughs> to try to figure out at the end of the day, and. Um, I will say it's been it's been fun doing it. It's been fun trying to figure out how to do this. Well, and that's something that I wanted to ask you both was that so you both have mentioned luck, right? And that um, I guess for better for worse plays a role. We can talk about that a little bit more. But also, it is I think the not easy, but I think it would be understandable if both of you, you know, after maybe like a year, you were like, well, we gave it a shot, or maybe after two years. You know, you were like, well, this is good. We successfully provided additional spaces for quality childcare for our employees, for our community. But what uh, what I'd love to hear about more for, from both of you is what has been sort of the, the motivation or the, the drive to keep it going? Because it, it's not a light lift. It's not a small part of your time. And so what makes it a priority 
now that you've had this baseline, what makes it a priority to make sure that you continue these centers and if anything, increase the amount of access? Well, I mean, it's not easy, but you know, it, nothing is. And <laughs> you're starting at, you know, owning a small business or owning a farm. It's like the challenges are, you know, they're there every single day. And, um, you know, also you haven't met my wife. She's the most stubborn person in the world and it's not going to back down from anything. Um, doesn't matter how challenging it is. So beyond just the basics of running a small business being challenging and, and being stubborn, um, the need is explosive. I mean, you, you, you could never go backwards once you see the benefits and once you see the need. I mean, in our three county um, kind of region, it's called the New River Valley, there's 9,000 kids who need childcare uh, under five and there are 4,300 slots. So people are desperate for childcare. And once you provide this amazing service to your employees, um, they come to rely on it. How could you possibly take it away from them? Uh, it, and, and the benefit of, of watching it unfold, watching the children be together in, 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 a, in a familial, and close and enriching environment, you know, I mean, I should add that's that was a big part of why we wanted to do it and why we were motivated to really do it is that, you know, we wanted it to be a positive environment for our children. We wanted it to be based in good models. I mean, the teacher that came to be the director was a Montessori teacher, and she's brought so many of those fundamental principles to the school to the daycare to be able to give a, a real enrichment and not just have it be glorified babysitting and watching the kids that have come up through there be together the way that they protect each other and care about each other and the, and the just the feeling of sort of almost the being uh you know in a family is is so amazing to behold and it's so enriching just for the the culture of our business you know, we, we, we don't like to give responsibility to our employees like we're a family, but um, we do like to behave as if we were, are responsible for each other like a family. And it, it shows. Well, and I, I, Hayden, I think the same, same way that you said at the beginning there, where it's like, you can't unsee it once you see it. You know, you can't, the benefits, the, the, you know, the, all of the benefits, right? Not, which is a hell of a heck of a lot more than a, you know, a, a very little person getting, you know, getting education, right? That's, that's really important. And it's also like, <laughs> there's also a whole lot of other reasons why, why this stuff's important too. And like, once you, once you see it, once you see, once you know people, right. And like, it's that person, I, you know, for me, it's also like that personal thing where you, it's, it's. I mean, hating your employees, right? It's like the people that, you know, they're my friends, right? And they're my my friends' kids that go to Apple Tree and, uh, you know, use this thing that we created. It's like, it's great, right? And it's, it's, it's you know, it gives me pride in, you know, what we've done as a place to, to have this thing and to do it. But, like, once you see it, you can't go back, you know, and it's like, it's... Um, Aaron, I think more people need to see that. Apparently, I think that may be the <laughs> like they need to see it um, up close, and you know it's, but it's real too. That you know it's not we're not blowing smoke here. It's real. No, I completely agree, Adam. That it's I think that the more anyone really, I mean, it could be the business community, it could be policymakers, it could be community members that are maybe uninitiated or don't have yeah. kids under the age of five. Um, the more you see it and the more that you can see the impact of it, I think you both put it perfectly that it, you can't go back, right? And so, Hayden, for you, it's been, you know, in, in uh, it's been a growth period, both with uh, with the child care center, which is called Yellow Hen. I don't know if we've mentioned that, but I love that, Red Rooster, Yellow Hen. And so there, there's been sort of a parallel growth between Red Rooster and Yellow Hen. And then uh, Adam with Appleseed, you've 
pull all of these different levers, whether it's you know foundations, partnering with the hospital system, um, providing how many spots does Appleseed provide, um, Adam? Uh, so, so our center in Appletree Rensselaer provides mm -hmm. 70 seats for infants through five-year-olds, full day, five wow. days a week. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like a, along those lines, like if people only knew or if people could only see, um, for folks uh, that are listening that are, we call them sort of like the standing on the diving board, right? Like it's the, the folks who are like, okay, we've got to do something about childcare. Seems kind of overwhelming. Not 100% sure like what I can do from your experiences and from your models, what, is, what are sort of one or two pieces of advice that you would say, like, if you're gonna dive in, know this or don't do this, oftentimes just as helpful. Oh, I guess, I'll, well, do you wanna start, Hayden? Go ahead, Adam, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Adam. I, for, I think for, you know, if you're doing the, if you're going the community-based, like community-funded based thing, you know, and, and, and like, you know, actually, there's a whole host of models and ways to do this, actually. And I think, you know, he, what 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 Hayden and Red Rooster have done is is to some extent different, but all, it's a lot of it's the same thing as what Appleseed's done too. It's like, you know, if you have, you know, from from our perspective, the biggest thing was was um, this is going to sound silly, but like creating a five hundred one c three, you know, making the organization and making it real, um, you know. It was it was Appleseed was created to open a child care center, and then at, who knows what happens next. Um, but like taking that first step, which is real, um, it, it goes from converse in, in what happened for us and for us as an organization and the people that were involved with this is like it went from talking to action, um, you know, and that 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 is a big step actually. Um, it's it's the first step and it's the one that has to happen because one action be, begets another action begets another action and you never know where the future takes you um that'd be one thing from me from my perspective the other thing is um you know i think it's a it, sometime in rural communities it's hard to to stand up and be in like uh be a champion for something and it's okay to be a champion for something it's okay to say like I like I really love the place that I live, the community I am. Like I love living in Rensselaer, and I want it to be a better place. And it's okay for it's okay to say that, and it's okay to do things in that direction. Um, I guess those would be a couple couple things, way big picture, um, that were really important. And I think that it took took me the longest time to figure out both those that, that both those things are okay. That's awesome. Thanks, Adam. Hayden? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would I guess I would echo that. That's that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. And um I love it. I think on a more like granular granular level, you know, we we didn't really look at our costs um until we were well into it. It's kind of looking at it in the rearview mirror. And I mean, when we started out, we were offering care for a dollar an hour. Um, we've since doubled that to $2 an hour. Um, but what that means is our costs are super high. I mean, to Adam's point, you don't do it without losing money if you're gonna offer high quality care. And so, uh, yeah, we spend a, somewhere between 85 and $100,000 a year from Red Rooster to subsidize the childcare facility. So I think, you know, it's fine. That's that's what we have set out to do and we want to. I think another private organization, another, you know, privately held company could look and say, well, okay, we're just gonna offer amazing health, uh, amazing uh, childcare, but we're gonna charge, you know, the regular rate. We're gonna charge a, um, competitive rate with other childcare facilities and they would end up, you know, losing a lot less money or spending a lot less money on that venture. Um, you know, just there's, there's little things like that about really analyzing the cost of it before you leap in blindly the way that we did. But also I think it's just, you know, it requires a paradigm shift. I, I think it requires new, new glasses. Uh, I think that there's so many, 
ways that we look at children and we look at having children as being some kind of like selfish act that like, well, you had the kids, you know, now you got to figure it out. And, and that's not the way it is. It's a community action. It, it, it feeds our community to have kids, especially in these small towns, like, like Adam and, and mine, um, where you need children, you need the vibrancy of life. And, and, you know, you need to feed the, the population and, and, and enrich the community. And, um, you know, beyond that also, you know, as a, as a company, you're expected to, to fund people's health care. I mean, pe people are um, ha have the expectation that, that health care comes from their employers. And that's great. We do that. We pay full premiums and vision and dental and, and, and all of the above. Um, but I don't see why child care shouldn't be able to enter into that conversation to be seen exactly the same way. That to see that this is the expectation that your employer takes care of your health insurance. So why shouldn't your employer help you take care of your children? Um, I feel like they're part of the same conversation. And Hayden, I, I love that term paradigm shift. And in, in my line of work, I, I feel like it comes up a lot. Like we need to reimagine, we need to think outside the box, have a paradigm shift. Um, I could talk to you both for hours, but I know that you have lots going on. And so I won't take up hours more of your time. Um, but I am very curious uh, as sort of our, our last question of, of this conversation. So Hayden, whether it's uh, an, an employer, you know, creating and making a reality that paradigm shift or Adam, you know, looking around and saying, well, we can't do nothing. So let's do a lot. But you both also mentioned that it just objectively speaking there, it is a big investment of, of time, of resources, of, of money. Um, and if, if there was, I even hesitate to say one thing because there are so many different factors, but if there was one thing that you could change about the way that childcare is either viewed or the way that childcare is funded, but what is something on your ends that, you know, I, I hate this phrase, but if you could wave a magic wand, what is something that either would have made your quest easier or something that maybe we can do to make future communities, especially small towns, special rural communities, make this sort of less of a, a Herculean lift and more of like, oh, we can do that. Oh, well, I mean, mine is simple. I think that the, the um, state funding for low income child care the, the thresholds need to be much higher and that it's just well worth the investment for the state and, and maybe even on a federal level to, to assist with childcare. It is objectively better for society if children have great care when they're younger. I mean, I, I, I did. I'd agree with Hayden. When it comes right, it's money. When it comes, it, when it comes right down to it, um, you know, for places like Rensselaer or Floyd, right? Like whether it's and whether it's a, a company like Red Rooster or whether it's a community like Rensselaer, you know, the the real is the, at the end of the day, the cost to provide quality childcare is is more than what most the vast majority of people and families can afford to pay for it. Um, and there's there's always going to be a difference between that and like you know we fund we as a place right we as a country like we fund we f we fund higher ed we fund pre K uh, sorry we we do not fund pre K we fund K twelve education right public school education and and those are those are things that we we have places of you know as a country have decided to fund and see the importance of um, you know the reason I think that that you know, Hayden and, and I are on here for some reason is that like we're unique, right? Like we're we're in these small rural communities and we we've done it and we are doing it and we continue to do it. And there isn't more of us because it's really hard to do. <laughs> and um, you know, there's you know, you I know that obviously like universal child care, universal pre K, any you know, pre K in Indiana or or universal child care in general, that that's a heavy lift. You know, but there, I think there is there is things that, um, from a policy perspective, that can make things like 
yellow hen or apple tree make it be easier to create these things in, in rural communities. Um, you know, and this, the other, the, I know you said one, but the other one is, is I, I, I hope, and I, I've seen it, I will say that the conversation in the last five years around childcare is, is dramatically changed. And I know the U S chambers had a, had a hand in that and it's, it's continued. I don't think any of this will change until employers and the, and the business community continues to, to get behind this, um, you know, this idea of, um, you know, the importance of, of quality childcare, not only in rural areas, but throughout the country. Um, and it's changed, it's changed dramatic. The conversation's changed dramatically and in a great direction and um, look forward to what the future holds in the next few years in this space. Aaron. Adam and Hayden, I can't thank you both enough, um, both as a childcare policy nerd, so impressed with the, uh, the the things that you've done for your communities, but also just as a guy who has a one-year-old and a three-year-old and, you know, was born in a town of less than 2,000 people, uh, it's genuinely inspiring. And thank you both so much, both for joining us on the 27th at the summit and then for being so generous with your time today. Really appreciate it, guys. Thank you.